The following audio is from Christian Heritage Church. More information about Christian Heritage Church is available at chctoday.com. Exodus chapter 2, we're back in the series after two Sundays. We're back in the series, Exodus, the story of a redeeming God. I love the book of Exodus because it has so many parallels for you and I today. It actually shows us the hand of God, his willingness to involve himself in the life of men and women just like you and I. It shows us that he's powerful. His promise is yet true. He always brings provision to the people of God when we turn our attention and turn our hearts towards him. So this morning, I want you to hear the word of God and allow the spirit of the Lord to speak directly to you over the next few moments. Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 23, reading through verse 25, and I'm reading from the message translation. That's what's on the screen. Many years later, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Their cries for relief from their hard labor ascended to God. The next verse says, and God listened to their groanings. God remembered the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. And it goes on to say, God saw what was going on in Israel, and God understood. Father, in the next few minutes, allow those four statements to pierce our heart and our lives. I pray for those individuals in this room, and I know there are many here who are wondering, do you really care about me? Do you really know and understand my circumstance? Do you have the power to intervene and alter the course of my life? I pray for those individuals right now. And I pray for the Holy Spirit of the living God to speak into their heart from this moment forward, convincing them, convicting them, showing them that not only do you have the power, but you have the desire to interrupt their life and bring them help and hope and healing in Jesus' name. We pray all these things in the name that's above every name. And everybody said, Amen. When we read the book of Exodus, we come to the position where we're reminded that even the strongest, even the most mighty, even the richest, even the wisest have a need for a redeeming God. It doesn't really matter who we are or where we come from, what our social status may be. It doesn't matter our family, our lineage, our background, our education, our training, our vocation. It doesn't matter how much money we do make or we don't make. It doesn't matter how much we manage to store up or how little we actually possess. Exodus shows us that every one of us need a redeeming God. Every one of us need a God who comes to our aid and comes to our rescue, who has the ability to step into the middle of our mess and bring an answer each and every day. He is a God who desires to minister to us and through us and in us and prove himself faithful in a mighty way. Kind of reminds me of the lady whose husband died and he decided his whole life that he was going to take everything he had with him. So before he died, he put all of his treasure in a chest in the attic. When he died after the funeral, she went up to look and sure enough, it was still there. And she said, I told him you should have put it in the basement. All of us. All right. Some of you will get that three days from now. That's a pretty cute joke. You ought to think about it. We need to understand all of us, regardless of who we are, have a need for a redeeming God. We need God to move in our lives. Matter of fact, when you look at that word redeemed or redeemer in the English language, it comes from three Hebrew words. The first word is pada, P-A-D-A. And it literally means the substitution or requirement for a person to be delivered. We need to understand we need a pada redeemer. We need someone who will be our substitute so that we can be delivered. And isn't that what Jesus Christ did for us? He is a redeeming God. The second word in Hebrew is gala. And this one simply means it's a, it's a legal term of deliverance for a person or property to which someone had a previous claim or relationship. When you read the book of Ruth, pardon me, this is exactly what it's talking about. Boaz was Ruth's redeemer kinsman. He had a claim over her life because of that familial tie. 
We need to understand that we are all sons and daughters of God, created in the image of God. He has a claim on our lives. And because of that, because he created us in his image and in his likeness, then he has the right to redeem us and to bring us back into the family. And isn't that what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross for you and I? The third Hebrew word translated redeemer in the Old Testament is the word kafar. It's K-A-P-A. And it literally means to cover, as in to cover sin or to atone. So when I look at all those three Hebrew words, pada, gala, and kephar, it tells me in all those three, Jesus Christ can fulfills them all. He is our redeemer. He is the one who has actually bought us back. He had a previous claim on us and he's brought us back into the family. He covered our sin and that's exciting to me and it should be exciting to you as well. He is our redeemer. So when I read Exodus, it tells me that every man needs a redeemer. Every woman needs a redeemer. Every child needs a redeemer. None of us are exempt. Every one of us need to experience the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. And when you read the book of Exodus, you see God putting that principle into action in the life of not just one or two people, but an entire nation. God chose to act. God chose to intervene. God chose to bring deliverance. God chose to show salvation. God chose to prove his provision in the life of Israel. So when we look at this passage that we read this morning, we see four things. Number one, it says that God listened to the groanings of Israel. Number two, it says that God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And number three is where we're at this morning. It says that God saw what was going on in Israel. God saw what was going on in Israel. You'll remember from the first message in the series, and if you don't remember, buy the DVD or the CD, or go to iTunes, everything's available there at no cost whatsoever, or go to chctoday.com, every message is there as well, at no cost to you whatsoever. Someone said to me long ago, why are you doing everything for free? Well, I'm not going to preach it again, and somebody else may as well have it and be blessed by it, amen? I'm not going to put a price on the truth of God's word. So that's why it's free. We want you to have access to it and give it to your family and friends as well. So when you read that scripture and understand from that first message, 67 years Israel had been under oppression. Verse 8 of chapter 1 says, A new king came to the land who did not remember Joseph. And he began persecuting and oppressing the Israelites because he failed to remember what God did through Joseph to preserve his nation years and years ago. So now we find ourselves in chapter 2, verse 25, and it says that God saw what was going on in Israel. What did he see? He saw their bondage. He saw their slavery. Matter of fact, you can read it in chapter 1, verse 12. It says, the more the Egyptians afflicted Israel, the more they multiplied and grew. Verse 14, so the Egyptians made their life bitter with hard bondage. Wasn't a pleasant time to be alive if you were an Israelite living in Egypt. It was a very difficult place and difficult position. Filled with slavery, cruelty, mistreatment, hard times. But God saw what they were going through. God saw what they were going through. Can I tell you that this morning God sees you And he sees you exactly where you're at. He sees your visions. He sees your defeats. He sees your your hopes and your dreams. And he sees your fears. God sees your good things and your bad things. He sees everything there is about you. But this is the good news. It doesn't change his opinion of you. He loves you. He cares for you. He provides for you. He is still a redeeming God. Regardless of who you are or where you at. He wants to bring you back to him. He's a redeeming God. He sees you and never changes his opinion. You see, in our society today, he sees the effects of sin. He sees the ravages of disease. He sees the destruction of failed relationships. He sees the captivity of drugs and alcohol. He sees the bondage of pleasure. The bondage of position and, and possession, possessions, pardon me. He sees all of that. And that's exactly why Jesus Christ came to Calvary. 
Because God saw we were sinners and we needed a Savior. Amen? We needed someone to redeem us and bring us from the place that we were at. We were lost. We were hopeless. I know this doesn't wash in the American church. I know we don't like to hear it. But I've come to tell you again today, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is still the way. I've determined to lift up the name that is above every name. Every time I step on this platform and declare him to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the only hope for hurting and lost humanity. Oh, folks, it's not going to come through intellect. It's not going to come through education. The only hope for our society is the sacrifice sacrifice of Jesus Christ and once again bowing our knee to him and declaring him king of kings and lord of lords that excites me more than it does some of you I pray it gets in your gizzard here in a few days and you begin to say I want that too yeah Jesus is the answer Jesus is the answer someone said to me not long ago we need to get more intellectual We need to be more deep in our study of the Word of God. I believe in a deep study of the Word of God, but you need to understand, when I come in here on Sunday morning, I'm not trying to tickle your intellect. I'm trying to trigger your spirit so faith arises in you, and you rise up and say, God is well able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I can ask or even begin to think. Amen and amen. We need to understand it happens on the inside. When we begin to realize God sees, we're lost, we're hopeless, we're without help. We can't save ourselves, so he sent his son to do the job for us. He sent his son to deliver us and ransom us. What does the scripture say? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, look at the picture in Exodus. Before Israel cried out for deliverance, God put Moses in place. Before Canaan experienced famine 400 years before, God put Joseph in place in Egypt. What am I saying to you? I'm saying that God has already made a way of escape. He's already provided a pathway of deliverance. He has already given to you all that you need to rise up and rise above the pressures and the circumstances of today through Jesus Christ. He's just looking at you to say, I believe. I believe and I receive and allow him to move in your life. God sees, the scripture says. God sees. Interesting thing about that. He not only sees yesterday, he not only sees today, but God sees tomorrow. You and I have great uh, 2020 vision when we're looking back, don't we? We have perfect hindsight. We can see everything we did right, everything we did wrong, everything that we should alter, and we can see what's immediately in front of us today, but not a one of us in this room can see tomorrow. Not a one of us. And if you stand up and say, I can't, I'm going to rebuke you. (laughs) And I'm going to tell you, get that demonic spirit out of here. Come on, we can't see tomorrow. We see today and we see yesterday. Oh, God drops words of assurance and words of prophecy in our heart to give us a glimpse into tomorrow. But none of us can see tomorrow. But God can. God can. If we understand God sees, that he sees not only my yesterday, he sees not only my today, but he sees my tomorrow, it gives me confidence that I can put my hand in his and I can follow where he leads, knowing he's already got the way paved for me, knowing that he's going to lead me to victory because that is the promise of the word of the living God. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because too many of you are worrying about tomorrow. What did Jesus say? Can you add one cubit to your stature by worry? No. You can't alter your circumstance through worry. All you do is diminish your faith in God through worry. Oh, somebody needs to write that down. That's of the Holy Ghost. He's speaking to you today. You diminish your faith in God when you allow yourself to be consumed with worry and fear and uncertainty. Oh, it's time to cast yourself on the Most High God who knows your yesterdays, who knows your todays, who understands your tomorrows, and who has already told you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Follow me. Let worry go and put faith into action in your hearts and in your life and let God do something good in you. His vision is perfect. 
His vision is perfect. So the question is, if God's vision is perfect, what then are you seeing? God sees your circumstance. God sees where you're at. God knows where you're going. So what are you seeing? That's the question. See, it's about vision, both internal and external. You see, when I see as God sees for my tomorrow, I can say very clearly, I'm not looking at the things that I cannot see. I'm looking at what I can see. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I'm going to trust in him. I'm going to believe in him. It doesn't matter how hard the wind blows or how high the waters come. I'm going to hold on to God and God is going to see me through. What are you seeing? What are you seeing? What is your vision? Externally and internally, because you see, this is the key. If you only see externally, it will cloud your internal vision. You see, there's a lot of folks that are motivated by circumstances rather than being motivated by the Word of God and the counsel of God. I know I'm going to ride this horse till it dies, so you just hang on. We're going to keep riding it until you open the book, until you begin to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you through these sacred pages. Your vision will always be external. It will never be internal. But when you begin to see from God's perspective, when the Word comes alive in your heart, when the Word comes off the pages and implants itself in the bedrock of your soul, you come to the place where you say, it doesn't matter what I see. I know what I've heard. I know what I've read. And I'm moving on with the living God. Somebody shout amen. What do you see? What do you see? It's an issue in our society today. It's an issue in the church today. What do you see? Do you see a mountain of debt? Or do you see the God who made the mountains? What do you see? Do you see a diagnosis, a disease that's going to kill you? Or do you see the great physician walking into your life? What do you see? What do you see? Do you see family problems surrounding you, rebellious children, antagonistic spouses? Or do you see the Prince of Peace coming in and sitting down at your dinner table and resolving those conflicts because you have a sure word from the Lord? What do you see? It's a matter of vision, both external and internal. What do you see? You see, before God could deliver a nation, this is where it gets personal. Before he could deliver Israel from Egyptian slavery, he had to deliver Moses. What did he deliver Moses from? From himself. Don't shout me down. He had to deliver Moses from himself. Read it right there in Exodus 1 and 2. It says that Moses went out one day and he saw an Egyptian abusing one of his Hebrew brethren. And he looked this way and he looked that way. No one was watching, so he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And then the Bible goes on to say in the very next verse, the next day he went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting. And he told them to cut it out. And they said, what are you going to do? Kill us like you killed the Egyptian? And then listen, it says, Moses feared. Because what he did was found out. Here's the application. God's got to deliver you from yourself. He's got to set us free from our own worst enemy, which is raging within us. He's got to set us free from our logic. He's got to set us free from our preconception of the way things ought to be. He's got to set us free. You're not going to like it, but I'm going to say it. It's time he set us free from racial divides. I'm here to tell you, God's not black and God's not white. We need to understand he created every single one of us, and we're under the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's time for the church to stand up and say, stop the nonsense in our society. Set us free from that. When I look at you, yeah, I know your color of your skin is different than mine. But I'm not looking at the color of your skin. I'm looking at the content of your heart. And when I look at your heart and it's under the blood of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what color your skin is because we're brothers. We're sisters. We've been born again. We're redeemed. Set us free from ourselves. Before God could deliver a nation, he had to deliver a man. Some of you in this room need to hear that this morning because you are so wrapped up in nonsense, in pettiness. In ridiculousness, let God set you free from yourself today. 
so that he can use you. He'll never be able to use you until you allow him to break that junk off your life. He had to set him free from himself. So my question is, what's keeping you from seeing as God sees? What's keeping you from fulfilling your vision and your destiny? What's keeping you from being the man or the woman of God he's already called you and ordained you to be? What's keeping you from that? Moses realized what he did was found out he was afraid and he took off. He ran. And then he sat down by the well. Find out, you need to do that study. Do the word search. How many times did men of God fear and run and then sat down? Find it. It's there again and again and again and again. What does it tell me? It tells me it's a pattern of human behavior. If I see it repeatedly in the word of God, I'm going to see it in my life and those of you in this room as well. We fear because we did something that was found out or we did something wrong or we did something from the flesh and then we run. Can I tell you, that's no reason to run. It's no reason to run to Midian and sit down by the well. It's a reason to run to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and say, one more time, I blew it, but you're a redeeming God. Bring back one more time. Bring back one more time. You see, how you see yourself determines how God's going to move in your life. You either position yourself for favor, for faith, and for the power of God to move in you, or you position yourself for frustration and failure based on how you see internally and externally. Some of you need to write that down. That's a good statement. God does not see you as a failure. He sees you as a son. He sees you as a daughter. He doesn't see all of those things that you have laid waste in your path. But when you come to the cross, he sees you as redeemed. He sees you as righteous. What did Paul write in 2 Corinthians 5, 21? He who knew no sin was made sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. Oh, folks, it's not about you. It's about him. Get your eyes on him. Stop looking back there at what you used to be and look up there at what he's destined you to be. The righteousness of God in him. You look at the history of Israel, 67 years this nonsense had been going on. 67 years. Why did it take 67 years for God to raise up a deliverer? Because they were going along to get along. It's just life right now. It'll change at some point. Listen to me. Some of you need to put this in your noggin and think it over in the days ahead until you get fed up with where you're at and with what's going on. Don't expect God to come to your aid and to your rescue. As long as you're coddling that mess, entertaining that mess, going back to that mess, God's not a part of that equation. But when you say enough is enough, I don't want to live this way anymore. I am fed up. I'm tired of being a slave. I'm tired of my life being bitter. I'm tired of the hardship. I'm turning to the one who loves me. He comes. He comes. But you got to get fed up first. Enough's enough. And when you say, I don't want to do it this way anymore, and you turn back to him, God comes to your aid, comes to your rescue. Interesting New Testament story of the prodigal son. You all know the story. His father was wealthy, and the the boy just didn't like living on the farm. There's no other way to say it. I can identify I was that boy. I hated the farm. Couldn't wait till I turned 18 and I could blow that pop stand. I did not enjoy living on the farm and working the farm in western Oklahoma. Not my cup of tea, not where I wanted to be. I identify with that guy. One day he came to his dad and he said, Dad, I want my inheritance now. Typically he would have waited until the father died to receive his inheritance, but the father said, okay, and he gave it to him. And when you read the story, it says he went away and wasted it all, and I love the King James, in riotous living. In other words, he did everything he shouldn't do, hung out every place he shouldn't hang out, uh, was company with those who, you know what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15? He said, bad company corrupts good character. Somebody needs to remember that this morning. That's what happened to the prodigal. Bad company corrupted good character until his money was gone and suddenly he had no friends. He found himself feeding the hogs, 
eating what the hogs ate. There is no greater, I mean, Jesus couldn't have painted any greater word picture of absolute destitution than a Jew living with the hogs. I mean, that was it. That was the epitome. Nothing worse. And then it says he came to himself and said, even my father's servants have it better than I have. I'm going to go back and just ask my father to let me be a servant. I know I'm no longer a son because I walked away. I'm no longer a son because I took my inheritance and I squandered it. But maybe, just maybe, my father will let me be his servant. So he went back, and when you read that story, notice the father was on the road looking for him. He was waiting for him. His arms were open wide. And when he got close enough, he ran and threw his arms around him. And he said, bring me a robe. Bring me a ring. Bring me shoes. Kill the fatted calf. That which is gone is returned. We're going to have a party. Why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because the father is standing with arms wide open saying, if you'll turn and come back, if you'll give up that old life, if you'll realize i got a plan for you, he isn't going to discipline. He isn't going to be you over the head, he's going to welcome you back into the family. Welcome you back. But you got to see it first. You got to see it first. Give you another example of this very principle. The Bible says, book of Genesis, chapter 16, you know the story of Abraham and Sarah. God said to Abraham, you're going to be a mighty nation. From your loins, tens of thousands will come. They'll be as numerous as the sand on the seashores. Years passed, there was no child because Sarah was was barren. At some point, Abraham had obviously shared that promise with Sarah. And Sarah wanted to take things into her own hands. Now, how was she seeing? She was seeing externally. She was seeing a fatherless man. She was seeing a childless home. She wasn't seeing with the heart of faith. She was seeing externally. She said to Abraham, take my servant, have a child by her so that your name will continue and go on. Listen to me, here's the point. Too many times we hear the promise of God and then we tweak the promise of God. We hear the promise of God and then we improve on the promise of God. We hear the promise of God and we just got to mess with it a little bit. We just got to change it just a little bit so that things will be better and happen right now. See, when you're viewing externally, that's what happens. But when you have internal vision, God brings patience. So you wait for his word to come to pass over your life because it says, I watch over my word to honor it and keep it. And if it's promised you, he's going to do it. The Bible says in the verse of scripture that she gave her handmaid to him. And then after Haggai became pregnant, she started mistreating her. Sarah began mistreating her. Suddenly that old green-eyed monster of jealousy arose within her, and that girl who had served her so faithfully could do nothing right. My goodness, what a commentary on relationship. You see, when we're looking out there instead of with internal vision, we find ourselves surrounded with people who can do nothing right. They don't please me. Even though they did exactly what you asked them to do, it just doesn't work. Amazing, isn't it? Some of you take that to heart. Let God begin to change in your thinking process, in what you see this morning. The Bible says that she began to mistreat her. So much so that you read it in Genesis 16, 13. This is the words of Haggai. She ran away. And it says, in her amazement that God would take notice of a mere slave, she called him El Roi, the God who sees me. Who did God see, Sarah and Abraham, that the promise had been given to? No, he saw the slave girl. He saw the handmaiden. He saw the one that was thrust into his plan and kind of blew it all apart. He saw the one now that was persecuted, that was rejected, that was being given a hard time. Oh, I'm here to tell you today, it doesn't matter how mama or daddy treated you. It doesn't matter how that ex treated you or your current spouse treats you. God sees you. His name is still El Roi, the God who sees. He sees exactly where you're at and exactly what you're going through. Understand, he identifies with you. In the New Testament, there's the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, John chapter 11. 
great friends of Jesus. He stayed with them. They were BFFs, to say it that way. Great friends. Jesus was away in ministry, and they sent word to him, Lazarus, the one you love is sick. And you know the story, Jesus delayed going back. Matter of fact, he waited so long that the one who was sick then became dead. Lazarus died. When he went back, he had already been in the ground four days. And when you read it in John chapter 11, verse 33, you'll find these words when Jesus first encountered Mary. The word says these things, when he saw her weeping. When he saw her weeping. Again, the point is God sees. God sees where you're at. He sees what you're going through. When he saw Mary weeping. When you understand that, when you dive into it and you pull it out of the pages of the book, it tells us that he sees more than tears. He sees more than tears. He sees the source of the tears. Mary's source was two, I believe. Not only was her brother dead and she was grieving for him, but the Lord she loved had failed her. The Lord she depended on had failed her. The Jesus who had done all things, who had healed the sick, who had made the blind to see, the Jesus who had multiplied fishes, the Jesus who walked on water, this Jesus failed her. See, it wasn't just a matter of her brother being dead. It was her expectation being destroyed. Because when she and her sister sent word for Jesus, they were confident he would trot right back there. He would speak a word over Lazarus. He would be healed and raised and all would be well. But it didn't happen that way. He died. And when he died, her hopes, her dreams, her belief system was dead with him. He saw her weeping. Not just tears. He saw the pain in her heart. He saw the disillusionment. He saw the heartache. He saw the wasted years that she was holding at this point. The meals she had served to him. The time she had sat at his feet and listened to his word. Oh, hear me. Somebody in this room this morning, you need to understand. He sees your tears. He sees your frustration. He sees the source of your pain. He has never failed you, nor will he ever. It's time to put your eyes back on him and let him bring healing into your home and into your heart today. He sees you. He sees you. He saw our pain. We only see the result, but Jesus sees the source, the cause, and he comes to address it. Somebody in this place this morning needs to realize that true faith isn't God doing everything that I tell God to do. True faith is me putting myself in God's hand and saying, do with me whatever you choose. I am your child. I am your servant. You bought me with the price. You have redeemed me from the curse of sin. You have brought me back into your family. I am not my own to make my own decisions. I am yours. Do with me what you desire to do in me and through you. me. True faith is giving your job to God. True faith is giving your family to God. True faith is giving your health issues to God and saying, God, I trust you. Because if we don't do that, we're going to be just like Mary. Frustrated, disappointed, disillusioned, and crying because what we thought would happen didn't happen. Listen, God's greater than your circumstances. It's got to be about what do you see? Are you seeing externally or are you seeing with the eye of the Spirit of God? What do you see? Very quickly, I want to touch on one thing and then I'm going to close. The next verse says, God understood. God understood. The Hebrew word is Yahweh and it simply means to make himself known. Oh, I love that. God understood. In other words, no longer was God hidden from the Israelites. He was making himself known. This word has so many different meanings in Hebrew. Another one is mark as in X marks the spot. When God understood, God was marking his people. God was putting his mark upon their hearts and upon their lives. And he understood they were now ready for deliverance. When I read that, I recognize it's a story of timing. 
of understanding it took 67 years for them to be in the place where they were ready for deliverance. Now, that makes no sense to us. Why would I want to be a slave for 67 years? I don't know either, but that's the way we are. Why do I want to be bound to a vice or an addiction for half of my life? I don't know, but that's the way we are. Why do I want to be griping and moaning and groaning, complaining all the time? I don't know, but that's the way we are. Come on, somebody get with me this morning. Why do we criticize and condemn every single thing around us thinking we're the only ones who know what's right? I don't know, but that's the way we are. I don't know why it took 67 years for Israel to finally be ready for deliverance, but it did. Here's my point to you. If you will turn to him and call out to him, he is ready now to deliver you and set you free. He is ready now to move in your heart and to move in your life. I don't have time to go through all the illustrations of timing in the word of God. When God called David, he didn't immediately become the king of Israel and Judah. It was 13 years before he took the first kingdom. When God stopped Paul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, he wasn't an apostle the next day. It was 13 years before he went on his first missionary journey. So we need to understand God's timing and allow that to move and work in our life. When you look back at Moses, Moses saw an Egyptian being mean to a Hebrew, so he killed the Egyptian. He was out of God's timing completely. Yes, being a deliverer was in his DNA. That was his destiny. But it's about timing. So many of us in the church today allow our emotions to rule our decisions. See, that's exactly what happened with Moses. His anger got the best of him. His emotions ruled his decisions, and he committed murder because of that. We need to understand many times we make decisions from an emotional perspective rather than from a spirit-led perspective. Hear me. How you feel is not always right. Matter of fact, often it's incorrect. But what the Spirit of God reveals to you and confirms through His Word is always right on track for your life. Can I challenge you to stop being emotionally driven and start being spiritually driven? Let the Spirit of the living God lead you and guide you and direct you. Let the Word of God become that lamp under your feet and light into your pathway. Oh, you need to know and understand that when we choose to seek Him and put Him first, He leads us every step of the way. Every step of the way. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. It's time to stop being emotionally driven driven because when we are we're always hurt we're always disappointed somebody's always failing us somebody is always not measuring up to my standard and you will never be free until you allow the spirit of God to break that off of you and you begin seeing not externally but internally You're in this room this morning and you say, Pastor, there are so many things in my life that need to change. So many issues that I am struggling with. So many issues that I'm dealing with. I need God to come in today. I need God to do something in me today. You see, Jesus Christ has already made complete provision for your life. All you have to do this morning is reach out and accept Him. Ask Him to come into my life to redirect my paths and to help me become the person you created me to be. Across this room this morning, throughout this entire message, the Spirit of God has been talking to you. And there's something going on in you that's a battle raging. And today you want to simply surrender to Him. Give Him opportunity to be the Lord of your life. Forgive your sins. Turn the course in the direction of your life and set you free. That's you across this room this morning. I've been talking to you all morning. The Spirit of God's been talking to you all morning. That's you across this room. Will you lift your hand and say, pray for me. I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. As I wait a moment across this room this morning, pray for me. I want to surrender my life. Yes, someone else. Yes, someone else. Others. Yes, yes, others. Pray for me. Yes, others. Yes, yes, others. Others. Yes, others. Across this room this morning, I want to surrender to Jesus Christ. Yes, ma'am. Others. As I wait another moment, 
stand to your feet across this room, every person, please, all of those who raise their hand, lift your hand, look directly at me. If you raise your hand, look directly at me, not at anybody else, just right here. I want you to step out right now and come. Come on, step out and come. You raise your hand. You're surrendering to Jesus today. Come on, come. We're going to pray together. God's going to do a work in your life. Come on. Come on. From every corner of this sanctuary, come this morning. God's going to do a work in your life today. Come on. Don't wait for anybody else. Come on. This is all about God doing something in you. Anyone else? You want to join these who are responding? Anyone else? This is your time. Yes. Come on, young lady. Anyone else? Anyone else? I'm waiting another moment. Anyone else? You want to join these who've responded? Yes. Come on. Come on. Anyone else? As I wait another minute, this is your day. This is your hour. This is your time. And God has created this time just for you. To help you, to change you, to renew you, to forgive you. So those of you standing here, I want you to pray this prayer with me this morning. Please understand there's no power in the prayer. Power occurs when you, by faith, accept Jesus Christ into your heart. When you confess your sins to Him and confess Him as your Lord and Savior, that's when something happens inside of you that changes your life. So right now, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. And I cannot save myself. I ask you to come into my life. Cleanse my heart. Wash away my past. And give me new life today. I ask you to be my Lord. I ask you to be my Savior. I ask you to touch me right now. Let your blood wash through me. Change me. Change me. I don't want to be what I am anymore. Change me. By the power of the Holy Spirit, change me, I pray. Change me, I pray. Change me, I pray. Lord, do your work in the life of each one of these individuals right now. Touch them, Father, with grace. Touch them with new life. Touch them with your Holy Spirit power. Oh, Spirit of God, come down into them. Remove their sins. Make them white as snow. Change them. Create in them a clean heart, oh God. Renewing a right spirit in each and every one of them. Oh, Lord, the tears are evidence of our desire for you flow in our lives right now. Change us, Father, I pray. Make us the people of God you created us to be. Give us a new hope. Give us a new destiny. Give us a new life today. I pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, church. Welcome them into the family of God. Let them know we're thrilled that they've met our Savior today. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening to audio from Christian Heritage Church located in Tallahassee, Florida. Feel free to give copies of this message to others, but do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. For more information about Christian Heritage Church, please visit us online at chctoday.com. 